Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. Um, today, we have two breaking news stories that I'd like to start with. As this is breaking news, we don't have a lot of details and we expect to follow up on both of these stories later this week. Our first story is a sad continuation on our coverage of Arecibo Observatory. This morning, astronomers around the world are mourning the collapse of the observatory's main platform. This 900 ton platform, it, uh, it fell destroying much of the dish. This is the kind of destruction this facility just can't recover from. As you may remember, the National Science Foundation had recently declared they would not be funding repairs because the situation was judged just too dangerous. Because it's hard to say goodbye even to a telescope, many had been working on fundraising solutions, but now, it's clear the National Science Foundation made the right choice, recognizing that people are more important than telescopes, and this really was a dangerous situation. The images we're sharing come from Deborah Monterell, a meteorologist for WAPA-TV and a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Science is always going to have bad moments. This is not the first time a radio telescope has collapsed. Green Bank Observatory's 300 meter dish literally fell to pieces in 1988. A new telescope was built to replace Green Bank and it had updated everything and it does great science. We don't know what will happen this time, but I for one hope that a new radar facility will be created in Puerto Rico that continues Arecibo's legacy of shining light on asteroids that get too close to our planet Earth. All right, that news sucked. As a reminder that humans can accomplish great things. Um, I'd like to tell you that prior to going on air, we got confirmation that the Xiangyi 5 had successfully landed on the moon. If all goes well, this mission will collect two kilograms of rock and um, return to the Earth in just the next two weeks. Next up is a story I wanted to bring you last week in the hopes that our community could contribute some images. The National Solar Observatory predicted a large sunspot cluster would emerge in time for the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday weekend. That cluster did indeed emerge, and the observatory got a great image in H-alpha of the sunspots just peeking around the limb of the sun. You can see the image on our blog at dailyspace.org, as well as here. Sunspots are nothing new. However, we are just starting to move out of a solar minimum, which means those dark spots have been few and far between, if not altogether non-existent. And the real story here is not so much the what, but the how. Sunspots occur when magnetic field lines on the, of the sun get tangled up like a knot of spaghetti noodles. Different latitudes of the sun rotate and circulate at different velocities, causing the magnetic fields to drag against each other and twist together. The spots are cooler than the surrounding surface, which causes their dark appearance. And we are definitely interested in those spots because when those magnetic fields snap and realign, there is usually a solar flare. The bigger the grouping of sunspots, the greater the potential for a solar flare and the larger that possible flare could be. A solar flare releases massive amounts of radiation into space, and that radiation can cause issues with radar communications here on Earth. Of even greater concern is the possibility for a coronal mass ejection, or CME, which has the potential to disrupt power grids and satellites. So scientists have been working diligently to understand solar cycles and sunspots to keep us forewarned. And this recent grouping was predicted five days in advance of coming around the limb of the sun using helioseismology. Per the press release, the team has been listening to changing sound waves from the sun's interior, which beckon the arrival of the large feature. 
Recent changes in these sound waves pointed to the imminent appearance of a new sunspot group, which we can now see from Earth near the eastern solar limb. The process works similarly to how we listen to sound waves traveling through the Earth's interior to determine the planet's structure. The release goes on to explain, helioseismology can highlight structures on the sun that cannot yet be seen from Earth. Millions of sound frequencies bounce freely throughout the sun's interior, like a bell. Regions of strong magnetic fields perturb these sound waves, thus a change in wave signal measurements indicates that sunspots may be present. The team predicted this sunspot grouping on November 18th and imaged it on November 24th. That is a decent amount of lead time for a potential threat to our infrastructure when we previously had 15 to 18 hours of warning for a fast moving CME after the fact. Also, if you have pictures of these sunspots, we will share them out on our social media with your credit. We can be found at CosmoQuestX on both Twitter and Instagram, so feel free to tag us. As much as we wish that all the cool stuff in the sky could be seen with backyard telescopes. The reality is some stuff just can't be seen, well, at all. Specifically, dark matter, one of the dominant ingredients of our universe, denies direct detection and can only be seen by how its gravity affects galactic rotations and galaxy movements, and by how it twists light of the distant objects. Our current theories for cosmology generally tell a story of massive dark matter halos collapsing together gravitationally in the early days of our universe and pulling into their centers the kind of matter that we can see, the material capable of forming stars and other luminous structures. In this story, there's space for dark matter halos to collect more or less luminous matter and for there to be places that have only dark matter and nothing luminous at all. What wasn't explained in this story is how you can get a luminous galaxy with no dark matter, and that's something that we actually find now and then. And it turns out the reason our story doesn't explain how these systems can form is because they probably don't form that way at all. In a new paper appearing in the Astrophysical Journal with lead author Maria Montes, astronomers describe how the Hubble Space Telescope images of the dark matter-free galaxy NGC 1052 DF4 appear to have recently undergone some kind of collision or interaction with a nearby massive galaxy NGC 1035. Um, it appears that interaction stripped the dark matter from the smaller NGC 1052 DF4. According to Montes, we used Hubble in two ways to discover that NGC 1052 DF4 is experiencing an interaction. This includes studying the galaxy's light and the galaxy's distribution of globular clusters. Specifically, they found that 7% of the galaxy's luminous material had been torn into tidal tails, and the globular cluster distribution was consistent with the clusters being stripped out of the system. To further quote, the result is a good indicator that while the dark matter of the galaxy was evaporated from the system, the stars are only now starting to suffer the disruption mechanism, explained team member Ignacio Trujillo of the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canaries in Spain. In time, NGC 1052 DF4 will be cannibalized by the large system around NGC 1035, with at least some of their stars floating free in deep space. More work is needed to see if other low dark matter and dark matter free galaxies also show signs of ongoing disruption. It may turn out that these systems are simply caught in the middle of being consumed, where the dark matter was eaten away first, leaving the stars, well, safe for dessert. Once again, I bring you a story that may shed light on the formation of our own solar system by looking at distant stars. In a new paper accepted into the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society with lead author Joshua Lovell, researchers detail the observations of fast moving carbon monoxide gas flowing away from a young low mass star. Per the press release, 
The detection was made with the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile as part of a survey of young Class III stars, reported in an earlier paper. Some of these Class III stars are surrounded by debris disks, which are believed to be formed by the ongoing collision of comets, asteroids, and other solid objects known as planetesimals in the outer reaches of recently formed planetary systems. The leftover dust and debris from these collisions absorbs light from their central stars and re-radiates that energy as a faint glow that can be studied with ALMA. The star, NOLUP, is a Class III star and about 70% of the size of our sun. These types of stars are expected to only have cold, dim dust left by this point in their evolution as the biggest gas giants have formed and all that should remain is the equivalent of our own Kuiper belt and Oort cloud. NO LUP is the first class three star observed to have carbon monoxide and even more intriguing is the speed and scale of the ejection. Grant Kennedy, who led the modeling work explains, we found a simple way to explain it by modeling a gas ring, giving, but giving the gas an extra kick outward. Other models have been used to explain young disks with similar mechanisms, but this disk is more like a debris disk where we haven't witnessed winds before. Our model showed the gas is entirely consistent with the scenario in which it's being launched out of the system at around 22 kilometers per second, which is much higher than any stable orbital speed. Some of the gas may even come from the collision of asteroids or sublimation of their various ices. The release goes on to note, there has been recent evidence of the same process in our own solar system from NASA's New Horizon mission when it observed the Kuiper Belt object in 2019 and found sublimation evolution on the surface of the comet, which happened around 4.5 billion years ago. We may be witnessing the destruction of comets in a system 400 light years away. As co-author Mark Wyatt said, while we have seen gas produced by planetesimals in older systems, the sheer rate at which gas is being produced in this system and its outflowing nature are quite remarkable and point to a phase of planetary system evolution that we are witnessing here for the first time. This observation only lasted 30 minutes. Imagine how much more they could learn with more observing time. And now we add even more pieces to the planetary system formation puzzle. And from one kind of a star, we now turn to another very, very different kind of star, or more like stellar death. Okay, I'm here to talk about short gamma ray bursts that are linked to neutron star mergers and associated with events called kilonova. These detonations in gamma ray light are very briefly the most luminous objects in the universe. For over a decade, people have been looking for ways to use these objects and other longer period gamma ray bursts as standard candles to measure distances to the farthest corners of our universe. Now, standard candles are our way of measuring distance in astronomy. We know that there are certain objects that always give off the same amount of light, the way you expect a 100 watt light bulb to always give off the same amount of light. And when we see these objects, we can calculate their distance by measuring how bright they occur and knowing how luminous they actually are. Conveniently, when white dwarf stars explode as type 1a supernova, since they consistently more or less explode with the same amount of mass, they consistently more or less explode with the exact same luminosity. Now, the problem with trying to use gamma ray bursts as standard candles is they tend to all be very different. And this is where sometimes, instead of fitting data to a line, you fit it to a plane. Neutron stars, the, the uh, well, ingredients in those kilonovae, they come in a whole variety of different sizes, rotation rates, and many other characteristics. And when they merge, they give off a peak of gamma ray light that can vary in duration, and they also give off a variety of X-ray light as well. A new paper appearing in the Astrophysical Journal with lead author Maria Feminetti describes a fundamental plane for neutron star mergers that allows their luminosity to be predicted based on the duration of the X-ray plateau, how long they maintain their X-ray brightness, 
and the luminosity of the gamma ray peak. The work is still messy, by which I mean there's a lot of noise due to the combination of these objects being rare and very rarely close enough to accurately measure. This is a situation where we need more data. We build our standard candle library one tier at a time. We measure distances to the nearest stars using parallax, which is just a matter of geometry that is used by surveyors here on the surface of the Earth. From these stars that we use trigonometry to measure the distances to, we figure out, well, luminosity for certain variable stars is constant. So we have the Aurularis, the Cepheids, that each have their own distance luminosity relationships. This gets us to the nearest galaxies. There we start looking for the type 1a supernovae, and those we can see out even further. Well here, what we need is to start finding these short gamma ray bursts, these kilonovae, in galaxies that we already know the distance to from type 1a supernova. And by getting both of these kinds of measurements of objects in the same system, we can beat down on the noise. For now, we're using secondary, secondary ways to get at the distance to systems to try and calibrate this out. It's imperfect, it's not great, but it appears with a lot of noise to work. So here is to hoping that we see a bunch of these short gamma ray burst systems in places where we've previously seen type 1a supernovae. My next story returns to the theme of graduate students doing good work. Cole Gregg is a grad student at Western University in Ontario, Canada. Like the rest of us, Greg is stuck working from home, unable to travel. He has, however, remote access to the AstroCamp Observatory Telescope in Nerpio, Spain. While using the telescope on November 18th, Greg noticed an object moving through his field of view that turned out to be an as yet undiscovered asteroid. He and his professor worked together and determined that the asteroid is about 50 to 100 meters in diameter and passed through near Earth space. The asteroid now has the temporary designation ALA2XH, while the Minor Planet Center confirms the observation and determines that it is unique. Unfortunately, weather conditions have not been cooperative on the mountaintop where the remote observatory sits. We hope Greg's discovery is confirmed and look forward to a new telephone number for this asteroid. Sorry, laughter at that last story, the telephone number of asteroids. Um, I was laughing, people, thus the delay in moving to the next scene. Uh, asteroids do start with telephone numbers, but you can name them. This is a reminder, asteroids can be named. Remove the telephone numbers whenever you can, people. All right, that's not what I'm actually here to talk about. I am actually here to talk about uh, magnetars. In this case, magnetars in a place where we hadn't experienced them before. We know that there are binary gamma ray systems scattered throughout our galaxy, systems that are interacting in ways that indicate there is a massive star shedding material that is then interacting with a compact companion and periodically releasing bursts of gamma ray energy. What has been unknown is if these are typically systems that have a massive star and a black hole or a massive star and a neutron star and what hadn't really been discussed is, could these be a massive star and a magnetar, which is a very special kind of neutron star with an exceedingly powerful magnetic field? Okay, this is one of those stories where you have to start to go from astrophysics into pure physics. And this new paper appears in Physical Review Letters and um, the author, is uh, Hiroki Yanedo, and in their 
FizzRev Letters paper, they describe how one of the gamma ray burst systems in our galaxy, first of all, has a slow rotating neutron star. And by slow, I mean it rotates about every nine seconds. And it appears to have an extremely powerful magnetic field based on how fast it's able to accelerate particles. This system essentially contains one of the most powerful particle accelerators in our universe, the kind of place we really wish we could build on Earth, but you don't want to live that close to a magnetar, so we settle for what we can do with the Large Hadron Collider. So this particular system is doing massive particle accelerations, and it is through this combination of massive particle accelerations indicating a massive magnetic field and the slow rotation of what appears to be a standard pulsar that has led them to identify this system as being a massive star and a neutron star that happens to be a magnetar. This is the first time a magnetar has been identified in a binary system. Now, as you may remember, we had a story recently about how magnetars can get formed by two smaller neutron stars merging together to form a massive neutron star that happens to be a magnetar. As we said when we presented that research, that is probably not the only way that magnetars form, but this leads to the interesting thinking that this system could be two massive stars that form together where one formed a neutron star. This could be a system where they glommed on to each other later in life. And this could be the result of two neutron stars merging together and ending up in a binary system with another massive star. As always, the universe is far more creative than anything we could ever imagine. And I really look forward to seeing well, what physics we figure out using this astronomical source. Finally, today is Giving Tuesday, and on this Giving Tuesday, it is only appropriate that we use our voices to uplift another cause. The Kwasan Observatory was established in 1929 at Kyoto University in Japan. Former observatory director and organizer of a Kickstarter, Kazunari Shibata, writes, Kwasan Observatory is the second oldest university observatory in Japan and has a unique research history, including key involvement in solar coronal research and pioneering the study of Martian meteorology. The observatory has also been a very important hub in Japan for outreach activities. So much so, it is known as a sacred place for amateur astronomy in Japan. However, the financial future of Kwasan Observatory is uncertain, and we are looking for outside funding to support its continued existence. A large part of the reason for the uncertain future of the observatory is that it is no longer used by Kyoto University due to the increasing light pollution. The university moved their operations to the Hida Observatory and the Okayama Observatory, and the Okayama location essentially received the funding that was going to Kwasan back in 2018. To keep the observatory up and running, Shibata's Kickstarter looks to raise $10,000 US, and there are physical rewards involved, including an educational ebook and digital photos of astrophysicist and queen guitarist, Dr. Brian May, visiting the observatory earlier this year. All to save a space that is important to the local amateur astronomy community and the overall astro culture of Japan. We'll have a link to the Kickstarter on our website, dailyspace.org, and you can find more information about the observatory and its history there. This has been The Daily Space. As Beth said, this has been The Daily Space for December 1st, which this year is Giving Tuesday. We are so grateful to all of you who have found it in your budgets to donate to us to keep the show going year after year. As I say every week, one of the best ways that you can support us is over on patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX, where there are a variety of rewards and where your sustained donations allow us to know each month just what we can count on to keep our programs going, to keep our servers paid for, and as makes me most grateful, to keep our staff paid for. You allow me to pay a variety of people a good living wage that, well, thank you. Now, if you would like to help and you aren't already and you are financially able, 
please consider becoming a new Patreon. We are looking to find 60 more people to join our Patreon community by the end of this year. Will one of them be you? Join at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. This has been, once again, The Daily Space. <music>